Well, welcome, and uh, appreciate your uh, being out and attending today. We have uh, our speaker today, uh, Mr. John Sorensen, who is uh, CEO and uh, president and extraordinary employee of his own bank. Uh, I've known John for a long time. He has his uh, lovely daughter with him today, uh, Morgan. I remember when she was born. But, uh, <clears throat> and she graduated from the University of Utah, and is John, uh, a CPA by education and also experience uh, at Touche Ross in Los Angeles for seven years, five years down there. Came home to uh, uh, work in the family business and to uh, uh, help start up their uh, credit department there at uh, Southeast Furniture in Sugar House. And uh, probably none of you remember that having been around, but Sugar House was the, uh, oh, you <laughs> good. Huh? Uh, Sugar House was the furniture capital of the world. You could, uh, you know, there were all dozens of, of uh, furniture companies there in Sugar House. Anyway, the Sorensen family, a pioneer family to the valley here, uh, started up that business and uh, for many decades ran that. And when I was working at the bank, uh, we were able to provide funding that they would then provide for their customers to, uh, to buy furniture on credit. That grew into a, uh, a bank uh, and, a, and a successful bank here in the Valley. A great success story, uh, family owned and run and uh, an entrepreneur and going through all kinds of difficulties over the years as any business does, but a survivor. And uh, the, the, the uh, as Mr. Sorensen will say, a lot of it is, uh, is uh, luck but uh, he has a great story to tell, much to learn, and we want to make sure we leave enough time for questions. So uh, in, welcome, if you would. Hey, thanks. Hey, I'm excited to be here. Um, you know, there's a, a, a quote from a Lutheran minister. His name was Jenkins Lloyd Jones, and he founded the All Saints Church in Chicago. He was born in 1843, and he basically, um, said that if a man gives a bad 30-minute speech to 200 individuals, uh, he wastes a half hour of his time, but he wastes 100 hours of the audience. And uh, he says that is a hanging offense. So hopefully uh, I, I won't uh, be going there. Um, back in 1893, 18, eight, I'm sorry, 1897, there were two individuals. One was named John Stewart, and the other individual was named Thomas Clark. And they formed, they incorporated a corporation called the Chicago Flexible Shaft Company. And what that company did was it made shearing, shears for uh, shearing sheep and, um, and uh, for roaching horses, that would be trimming horses. And they were made by hand. They had a manufacturing company. Eventually, they were able to put electric motors on them. And a short period after that, in 1910, they uh, came out with their first household brand product. And that household brand product uh, was an iron. It was the Sunbeam Princess Iron. It was an amazing piece of equipment because what it did is it was an electric iron. And now you have to think back in 1910, People were, you know, who were ironing their shirts and that had a cast iron iron and they'd set it on a wood burning stove and they'd heat it up and then they'd iron your shirts and it'd burn your clothes because they couldn't control the temperature. And so it became an amazing piece of, uh, of, it was like just revolutionized the market. And the company did extremely well. In fact, in 1928, it, uh, it had their head designer, he was a Swedish immigrant, and I'm, I come from, I'm Danish Swedish blood in me, so his name was Ivor Jepsen, and he invented a mix master that had interchange, uh, the bl it had blades that you could detach for cleaning, and it was an amazing piece of equipment, and it became the flagship of this company, and eventually the company changed its name to Sunbeam. And you're wondering, how is all this tying in? Why, who knows, you know, but uh, just to give you an idea, Sunbeam was the major manufacturer in the 70s. It had sales of $1.3 billion worldwide and it hired 30,000 employees. That was in the 70s. Um, I worked for a family-owned furniture company. There were four brothers, and uh, one of them was my dad. 
and uh, I worked for a company called Southeast Furniture. And uh, that was in the, uh, I started working there in the 60s. And Southeast Furniture, uh, the brothers were quite uh, unique in regards to promoting. They took a big section of their parking lot that you would normally want to have for your customers and they fenced it off and they put a circus tent there and they decided they were going to sell patio furniture. And it was a huge circus tent. And eventually they got rid of the circus tent and they built uh, an aluminum awning and it was called the patio shop. And the patio shop generated in sales from the period of March through September it generated about $100,000 to $150,000 in sales a month. Uh, it, was, it sold more patio furniture. Not only did it sell patio furniture, it sold lawnmowers, above ground swimming pools, and sailboats. You're going, how did that work? But, it, but it, was, it was all outside and people would come in and it was extremely successful. Well, um, when I worked there, what happened is they sold more sunbeam lawnmowers than anyone in the Intermountain West. And um, the Sunbeam, they made a lawnmower that was, uh, back in those days, nobody hired anybody to mow their lawns. That, that would just be unheard of. So you could be 95 years old and you'd still have to mow your lawn. And so you'd have to, you know, it'd be hard to start the mower and that, you just figured that, but so you'd buy an electric lawnmower. Well, electric lawnmowers were underpowered. They, they could only mow for, they had a 12 inch and they had a 16 inch lawnmower. So if you had a decent lawn, it'd take you forever to mow the lawn and, and you'd, you'd have this electric uh, mower. Well, what ended up happening is Sunbeam came out with the idea that they were going to increase the horsepower and they were going to try to take market share away from the gasoline mowers. So they came up with a three horsepower electric mower, uh, electric engine on top of this mower. And it was, it was a huge engine, and they expanded the blade to 22 inches. And uh, they decided to come out with a campaign as a lion of a mower. And they had pictures of lion's heads, and they put them on top of this large engine that you would see it was a, a lion's head. Well, in addition to that, what they did is they went out and they captured 200 female African lion cubs. And they declawed the African lion cubs, and they decided they would give the, each company that sold the most, la, uh, most lawnmowers a lion cub so that it would be a promotion. So you'd come in and people would be looking at the, you know, to buy this, this lawnmower, but they'd also have a lion cub or a lion in the place that they were buying it from. And so Southeast Furniture got one of the lions. And it was a, you know, it had grown there. And then at the end of the year, the plan was is that, that Southeast was going to have a raffle and raffle off and a lucky winner would going, was going to win a lion to take home with them and put it in their backyard. <laughs> so what ended up happening, a little side story of this, is that um, the individual who ran the patio shop was a guy named Charles McDonald, an incredible salesman. And uh, there was a guy named Sheldon Christensen, and Sheldon Christensen was a carpet layer, and he came out, and we'd have to take the lion for walks. It had a big chain, co uh, chain collar, and it'd really drag us around. And uh, Sheldon said, hey, Charles, is the lion tame? And Charles says, of course. Now, we're sitting around the patio shop because we're, we're uh, selling, and, and I was the cleanup boy and, and uh, also uh, set stuff up and eventually became a salesman there. But we're watching you know, this transaction take place, and Sheldon made the, mis the mistake of standing in front of the lion's cage. And uh, Charles went to open the cage, and the lion's excited because it's going for a walk. You know, if you tell a dog it's going for a walk, I mean, a dog gets real excited. But you tell a lion it wants, you know, it's going for a walk, it gets real excited. Anyway, the lion ended up leaping up onto Sheldon, put one paw on one side, one side on the other. Well, Sheldon thought he was going to be eaten. And the lion, they're big, I mean, they have big paws. Their paws are about this big. And so Charles realized that we had a problem, and the lion's kind of mauling Sheldon. Finally gets the lion back into his cage, and Sheldon's shirt's torn, and his pants are closed, torn, and... And Sheldon turns to Charles and says, I have to go home now. I think I've peed my pants. <laughs> anyway, uh, Sunbeam, uh, extremely successful. It ended up being sold several times. And uh, in, in uh, 1990, uh, 1989, I'm sorry, 1989, its total sales for that year had dropped to $189 million from $1.3 billion. In addition to that, um, 
the president, his name was uh, Albert Dunlap, was indicted by the SEC for overstating the financials by $60 million. Arthur Anderson, the CPA firm, uh, was fined and also prosecuted by the SEC. The company uh, eventually filed bankruptcy in 2001 and um, it's, it's still around. Some of them still exist today, but it is a, a fraction of what the company was. So the question is, is you know, what, what do we learn from this? I mean, besides, it, it, it's a great story about a lion, and hopefully none of you work for PETA or anything, but, uh, but what do we learn? I mean, do corporations, do companies, do they just, you know, do they just last a certain period of time? Or is, are they able to continue to perpetuate? I mean, is there a time period that a company or an idea comes out? I think one of the things that you need to recognize is that whatever was successful 20 years ago, 40 years ago, may not be successful today. And what's successful today may not be successful 20 years from now. And what's successful 20 years from now is people aren't even thinking about. So right now, there's a lot of changes that are taking place. I mean, you've got big box stores like uh, Office Max and Office Depot, they're merging. You know, um, uh, Radio Shack is closing, three to, they've announced they're going to close 300 to 400 of their stores. Um, uh, there, was a, uh, there was a company that came out in 1933, it was a singing telegram company. What would happen is, um, because there wasn't the internet and there wasn't all of this fancy equipment we have, you would basically contact Western Union and they had a subsidiary, it was a singing telegram, and you would h hire them and they'd have somebody come to your house and they'd sing happy birthday or, or sing to you. That company uh, went from 1933 to 2006. I, I'm literally amazed it lasted that long, but uh, you know, it, it ran its career. Um, you know, in regards to how people live, I, I guess uh, what I would say is that we as people and individuals, we, we balance our lives on an edge of swords, as, uh, on an edge of a sword as we walk through life. Um, Albert Dunlap, I mean, when you're in a situation where you're in business, um, what ends up happening is you get tempted to do certain things. I'm gonna to explain, to, there's a bank that was in St. George it was called Sun First Trust Bank. And Sun First Trust Bank was in St. George, and St. George in, uh, in, the, in about five years ago, I mean, just hot, just a hot market. Everybody's lending there, and they're based out of St. George, and they're making construction loans and lending like crazy. And uh, what ends up happening is the market goes upside down, and real estate values drop by 80% and the bank falls under regulatory order. FDIC comes to them and demands that they infuse capital and uh, otherwise they are going to be closed. And so they go out into the community and they find someone that they think is a successful businessman. His name is Jeremy Johnson. Now some of you may have read about Jeremy Johnson in the paper, but uh, he has an internet company and he, uh, he's extremely successful. They need to raise $10 million. And he says, hey, I've, I've got four to $5 million I'll give you. I need a position on the board. And also, I've got this great business that you guys can process um, my um, credit card transaction and my debit card transactions. And so they look to this guy and they go, this guy's going to save us. So they bring him on board, he gives them the money and uh, he's on the board, and they start processing uh, transactions for him because the bank can process credit card transactions, and they process $120 million of transactions through this little bank. And of the $120 million, they make $2 million in fees. It's a high revenue source, and they've come to the conclusion, we found the guy who's going to save us. Not only did he give us $4 million, but we now have a, we're making money and we can offset the losses that we've incurred in our real estate portfolio. FDIC comes in and does an exam and it's determined that um, 
they're transacting for internet gambling and uh, they've been money laundering and they in, um, all of a sudden they issue a cease and desist order on the bank and uh, the chairman of the board pulls up into his parking stall one morning and U.S. Marshals are there and handcuff him and haul him to jail for money laundering. So what ends up happening is, is peop, as we walk on this edge of the sword, and if you have financial challenges that face you, there's great temptation to, you know, maybe, you know, he may or may not have known what he was doing. I know that Albert Dunlap in Sunbeam, in that example, may or may not have known. But, but what ends up happening is you have to continue to work your life, you know, and, and say, you know, face things straight, uh, straight ahead. Um, you know, one of, our great, one of your greatest strengths, your greatest strength that you have, and if you really look at it and you look at yourself and you say, what's my greatest strength? You know, you know the, really, your greatest strength can also be your greatest weakness. And your greatest weakness can be your greatest strength. Th that, that, that doesn't make any sense, but it's true. I'll give you an example in um, uh, a bank, Barnes Bank. Okay, uh, maybe you know about Barnes Bank. Barnes Bank does not exist anymore. Barnes Bank was a bank that was around for 100 years. It had capital of, of more than $130 million of capital. I mean, huge, huge amounts. I mean, if you were looking at Barnes Bank and you were looking at my bank, Home Savings Bank, you go, which one has more capital? It would be Barnes. Um, Barnes Bank made the decision to expand heavily in St. George. Their market was up in Kaysville and, and Davis County, and they had prospered and been ex extremely successful. Um, the family that owned Barnes had, had transferred it to um, um, other people to run for them, but they still owned, owned Barnes. Anyway, they went to St. George and they lent heavily, and they lent at high loan to values. And when the market changed, they had huge losses that were incurred. Now, what I look at Barnes Bank is I look at that and I say, if the timing had been different and the market had continued, then the executives at Barnes Bank would be out on the lecture circuit telling everybody how successful they were. But instead, what happened is the market went upside down and, and huge decreases in, in values. And so what ended up happening is Real estate came back, they had huge losses. And so what ended up happening is Barnes failed, not because of the amount of capital that they had. Barnes failed because of liquidity. They didn't have enough, they were having a liquidity crisis. The stockholders of, of Barnes Bank went to the newspaper and, and there became a fight. And so what happened is they started having a liquidity run and so what happened when that happened, FDIC stepped in and took them over and seized that bank. But if, if when I'm saying your greatest strength is your greatest weakness, in that situation, if, you are, if you're the type of person that's you know, excited and, and is out there and willing to push those limits and your timing is great, you can be extremely successful. But if, you're, but if your greatest strength is to be more cautious, that works more in a downward market, and that would be your greatest strength. So in our lives, we, as, an, as someone that's in business, or even whether you're in business or not, you have to look at what your strengths and weaknesses are to determine, you know, and try to keep that on the balance of the edge of the sword or the edge of the knife. Um, Henry Ford, um, uh, an amazing man, but his strength, I mean, Henry Ford did not invent the automobile. He didn't invent the combustible engine. But what he did invent was the ability to produce a car at a very low price and drive those costs down. Uh, he only had a seventh grade education. Um, and um, his thing was Model T. 
The problem was Henry Ford had a tremendous ego. That was his weakness and his strength. In his personal life, his son Edsel, you know, he was always at conflicts with Edsel. And Ed's, it was Edsel's idea to move to the Model A. The time had come where people wanted a car with color, wanted more power. And so they closed the plant down, you know, against Henry's wishes. They came out with the Model A. It was really Edsel's project, but Edsel did not get any of the, did not get any of the credit for it. Henry did. And the problem was Edsel eventually died of stomach cancer. And throughout his life, you know, Henry always took the, the uh, limelight, or always took the spotlight, um, and never gave any reward to anyone else. In business or in life, what I've found is that if you reward people and, and, and let them know that you appreciate what they can do for you and what they do for you, it pays great rewards. I'm not the smartest guy, you know, in fact, I, you know, I'm in the room. And so what ends up happening is I recognize that the people that are in the trenches, the people that are doing the things, the people that are on the front lines, they know more about those items than I do because they're working in those situations. So when you're in a situation where you've got people that are working for you or you're working with, recognize those people and recognize the strengths that they come and reward those people. And, and when I'm saying, you know, rewarding them, you know, just kind words. I mean, people will, will work for just the recognitions of, of, of a kind word. You know, Frank Lloyd Wright had a quote in regards to what success was. It says, uh, I know the price of success, um, dedication, hard work, and an unremitting devotion to the things you want to see happen. Uh, it does take hard work to, you know, I think a number of things to be successful. It takes luck. I'm a firm believer in that. Number two, it does take hard work uh, and timing. Are, those are the three items that I think are, are successful and, you know, that you need to be successful. And you can be the smartest one in the room uh, and fail. Um, failure is, the way I look at failure in business, is failure is a predator that is constantly, uh, constantly looking, you know, out on the perimeter. And sometimes the perimeter is stronger than others. But failure is always there. And you have to, and I recognize that every day I'm in business, I have risk. And some days I have less risk than others. But failure is, is a predator that is constantly looking to prey on me. Um, in 1961, um, the bank actually was founded as a finance company. And it was financed with uh, um, a deposit of, of $5,000. My father put in $5,000 and he hired, a, uh, he hired a college student to work part-time. And they financed sales finance contracts for Southeast Furniture. Um, and he finally convinced two other investors, his brother and his sister-in-law, to put in 5000 also. That is the basis of the bank today. The bank actually started in 1961 with $15,000 eventually. That, today, that, will ne that, will not, that could not happen. But in 1961, it could. There are things that happened you know, 20, 40 years ago that you cannot do today. But there are opportunities and challenges today that you have today that we didn't have back 20 years ago. In, in the company, the, the finance company, basically we were undercapitalized. We merged another company together. It was called Elko Corporation. It stood for my, my mother's name was Elaine. So it was the first initials from her name, E-L, and then C-O for company. And we merged that company in to become um, an industrial loan corporation so we could take deposits. Uh, at that time, the requirement to have for capital was $500,000. And uh, we only had uh, about 150. <laughs> and you're going, how did this work out? So we had about $150,000 in total capital. Um, 
my dad came to me. I, had, I had just sold a house in California. I lived in California. I worked for Touche Ross in California. And I had sold a house, and I had a check for $100,000. I did not trust the banking system. I, I actually put the check in my pocket, went to California, picked it up, put it in my pocket, and drove it back because I, I didn't tr feel that, that it was safe to wire the money to my account in Salt Lake. I, I didn't trust the wire, so I thought for 100000 that's too many dollars. So I got there, and my dad said, hey, you know, we're we need some more capital. Give, me, give us $50,000. So I gave him half of my money, $50,000. And the minute I gave it to him, it vanished. And, uh, but that was the basis of, of the bank. And so what happened is we, we were undercapitalized. We ended up going to the commissioner at that time. And it was an appointment from um, the, uh, it was generally put in, it, the guy's name was Merv Borthick, who Dennis knows. And Merv, basically had worked for Walker Bank, which actually started through the Walker Brothers. They were merchants. And so we met with him, and we were undercapitalized. And uh, basically, my father and I went in to meet with Merv, and my father gave me some great, a great uh, lesson. He said, whatever you do, don't say anything. <laughs> so I go, OK. So we go in to see Merv Borthick, the commissioner. We're undercapitalized, and they talk about fishing. That's what they talked about. They talked about fishing. He was a big fisherman. He was a friend of my dad's. And he, they had mutual friends. And they talked about fishing. And, uh, and, and then we get up, and he's, he shakes. Oh, my dad says, and this is John. He's a CPA, and he'll be running the business. And I went, hi. And I thought I was a trophy wife. And uh, he, uh, he gets up, and he says, you know, uh, you guys are good people. We'll take care of that for you. And so we get in the elevator, and I finally turned to my father, and I said, where we're coming up with $250,000, because that's what we were short, $250,000. Where are we coming up with it? I said, I don't have it, and I know you don't have it. Where are we coming up with it? He goes, my dad's comment was, we don't need it. We shook. It was a handshake. We shook on it, and Merv said he'd take care of us. Lo and behold, in two weeks, we get our approval, and we're an industrial loan corporation. Um, that was a trying time during then, because Southeast Furniture was in business, and Southeast was having financial problems. And so what happened is we were buying sales finance contracts, and Southeast Furniture was having major financial problems. Their sales were down. It was the early 80s, and there was an economic downturn in Utah in the 80s. Southeast Furniture uh, closed its door. When it, it did not file bankruptcy. It actually, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, it didn't file bankruptcy. It actually had her going out of business sale and closed and, and sold the real estate. At that point in time, the finance company, which was known as Home Credit Corporation, um, we were extremely small. And uh, we, we had to try to invent what we were going to lend on. All we had to lend on before were sales finance contracts. And uh, people stopped paying on their sales finance contracts. That was to finance the furniture. As soon as Southeast Furniture went out of business, our delinquency went to 36 percent, and and we could not we could not collect on the accounts. We were on the verge of of failure. In addition to that, the industrial loan corporation uh, industry was failing also. And what had happened is uh, there was now a new commissioner. Her name was Elaine Weiss, and she basically came out and said that everybody needs to apply uh, to get FDIC insurance. Um, we applied for FDIC insurance and were turned down. That was in 1985. We applied in, in uh, September of 1985. They came out. We had a staff of four people, maybe five. Let's see, there's my partner, Don, who's my partner today, me, my dad, my mother. Oh, we had one other person. So we had five people. Our total assets were $3 million and our capital, and we were, and we were losing money. They came and did the exam, and they, with, and they said, you don't qualify. So we were turned down. So we continued to work. What ended up happening is you do not know when you're in business or in life whether you've made the right choice. What had happened is uh, we made a choice that we would start buying real estate paper at a discount. Interest rates had gone back then. A mortgage rate went to 20%. Can you imagine that today? I mean, can you imagine going and going into your lender and saying, I'd like a mortgage. I'm thinking about buying a home. And they go, OK, the rate today, I got a deal for you. 
It's 19 and 7 eighths percent for a mortgage. Well, anyway, so what happened is people had their homes. They couldn't sell their homes. So they started selling them, and they carried back the paper. There were, back in those days, you could do that. There was not a due on sale clause. And so people had, they, they were carrying their own mortgages on their own homes. And they, and they said, hey, I want to buy another home. So we ran a little ad in a paper and said, hey, we'll buy your paper. And we had hundreds of people come in. And what you've got is my partner's a CPA and I'm a CPA. And so we had an HP 12C calculator and we would calculate cash flows to give us a yield of 18%. Well, the rates on the mortgages were like at 10. And so we'd calculate the cash flows. People would come in. All they really wanted was the money, but we'd go, just a second. We're loading them in. It'll be another few minutes. And we're loading them by hand on this little HP. And then we push the run button. It'd run, 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 run. And we'd go, OK, you know that $100,000 mortgage you've got? Hold on just a sec. We'll give you $62,432.18. You know? And they go, fine, we want the money. So we bought them, and we had these huge discounts. Well, when we were doing that, we had no idea that that was going to be the thing that saved us. So the sales finance, we were charging off loans and that. And, and it, when FDIC came in May of 85, we were turned down. In March of 86, um, I get a call from Ed Leary, who's now the commissioner now, and he says, you have to reapply for FDIC insurance. And, uh, I said, well, I need six months more. He says, you don't have six months more. We're going to close the industry. And I, he, he says, how do you end the year? And we had a fiscal year, and we ended in March 31st. Well, anyway, we had had, when FDIC came, we posted a $70,000 loss. In the next six months, we absorbed the $70,000 loss, and we had a $3,000 gain. So we made $73,000 in six months. And so we ended that year with a $3,000 gain and he goes, you have to reapply for FDIC insurance. And I said, you know, these guys aren't idiots. I mean, I need more time. I mean, I've had losses for five years. I'd had losses back to back. And timing is everything. And he goes, you have to reapply. So I get in a plane, and I get, uh, we have an individual on our board, Steve Swindle, and he's an attorney. And I'm a wreck. I've got, I've got a big briefcases of hand-prepared, there's no computers back then, hand-prepared charts. You know, we hand prepared, wrote them, you know, with ledger paper, and we're bringing them to FDIC. And I've got two big briefcases, and I remember sitting on the plane with, and I get one of the briefcases down, and I tell, you know, uh, my board member, okay, I need to go over these with you. And he goes, I, and he goes, I don't need to go over this. I'm just here to meet with the guy. I go, no, just in case I black out, I want you to be able to go over these financials. So anyway, we get there, we meet with FDIC. Uh, we, all we, we have just this lovely conversation. I'm a wreck, but uh, my board member's talking about artwork on the walls with this guy, and, and they go, okay, we'll be out next week. We'll bring a crew out. So we get back, um, and they send a crew. Now, there's five of us, and they send 10 examiners. <laughs> and uh, this is it. If we don't pass, we're done. We're, it's through. And uh, my father comes to to my house, and my mother and father comes to my house, met with my wife and I, and basically, this is what he said. He said, if we do not make it, if we can't pull this out, we will indemnify the depositors. We will make them whole. We will lose all of our money, but we will, if, if we lose any money, we will indemnify, and everyone will get paid their money. We will do that personally. We'll work the rest of our lives to pay that off. And I told my dad, I said, you know, we can file bankruptcy, you know, if this doesn't work out. And he said, no, you have to promise me that that's what you'll do. And I said, well, you know, I'll be moving back to California. And OK, I promise you that's what I'll do. That would never happen today. My father basically refused to file bankruptcy. And, and if we hadn't done it, we would, have, we, would have had to, we would have failed, and we would have had a shortfall. And we would have had to come up with money. Because when an institution is closed or shut down, the losses accelerate. They don't, they don't diminish. Because now it is no longer an, an ongoing machine. So we apply, and they're there, and they finally get ready to leave, and we don't know what they're going to do. And so I go in and I go, OK, do you want to tell me what's happening? And they had had the report from the previous exam. It actually helped us out, because they saw the improvement. Because now they had two exams, even though I thought, oh, you just throw that away. 
No, they don't throw anything away. And they said, well, we're going to recommend you for approval. But it still can be turned down in San Francisco and still can be turned down in Washington, D.C. And I remember saying, I'll name my children after you. Aren't you glad I didn't do that? This is my daughter. Um, so uh, and his name was Lauren. You could have been called Lauren. So Lauren Taylor. So, he, so it goes to San Francisco. I get a call from San Francisco. And you have to remember that I'm not a banker, and neither is my partner. I mean, we're both CPAs. I mean, we don't know anything about the banking business. I mean, we know how to, make, we know how to buy real estate contracts, but we don't know anything about banking. Nothing. And Dennis can, I, I used to go to Dennis for therapy and say, well, okay, so what do I have to do? And he'd tell me, i go, you're kidding, I have to do this? You know? So uh, when Dennis worked at First Security Bank. So um, all of a sudden what ends up happening is um, I get a call from San Francisco and I, I, I'm afraid to talk to him because I don't know the answers. And I, they're going to find out that I, I don't know anything. The guy asked me, you know, what my middle name was. I go, what do you want it to be? I'll change it, you know. And, <laughs> and he finally says, okay, we'll, we'll approve you. So it, goes to San, it now goes to Washington, D.C. Now it's July. And I get a call from the commissioner, and the commissioner says, of the state of Utah says, uh, your application is uh, uh, going in on the 22nd of July, and we're closing the industry down on the 24th of July. And I remember <laughs> saying, you can't do that. That's Pioneer Day. You'll ruin it for everybody. And he goes, that's when we're closing the industry down. And there's seven institutions that are going to be closed, and there's you and one other, one other institution that we're hoping will get FDIC insurance. So the 22nd comes of July 1986, and it goes, and we don't hear from anybody, and nobody calls us. So I get on the phone. I'm I, I need President Reagan. He was president of the United States then. Anyway, I get a call from Ed Leary again, and he says, stop calling everybody. He says, I've got bad news for you. I thought, okay, that's it. We're done. He's going to tell us that we've been turned down. I said, okay, what's the bad news? He goes, your application has been postponed to the 29th of July. And I said, Ed, you know, I'm an old CPA, and I know 29 is after 24. That's the only thing I know. And Ed goes, we have postponed the closure of the banks to August 1st. Now, you have to remember, our total assets at that time were only $3 million. We're, we're so small, and we only have five employees, counting myself. So I go, Ed, th this is go crazy. I, I'm getting an ulcer over this. My board... You know, everybody's thinking we're going to get sued. Everything's on the line. So he goes, yeah. You get, he says, well, that's two days. I said, that's only two days. He goes, that's two days more than the other institutions. So on the 27th of August, I get a, I get a call from Elaine Weiss, and she says, you're not supposed to know this yet. You'll be getting a telegram from Western Union saying that you've been approved, but there's some subject twos on it. So we're out, all of a sudden I go, yeah, hey, you know, we're screaming. We're, the five of us, we're throwing paper in the air. And uh, it comes back and it says, okay, you're approved for FDIC insurance on the following condition. The condition is, is that you have to go out and get a fidelity bond, you know, for a banker's bond. And I go, I don't even know what that is. You know, so I'll go get it. So, you know, and, and then we don't know. All of a sudden, it's, now it's July 31st. And we're not FDIC insured. But we don't know whether they're going close or not. But I'm afraid to call them on the phone because I thought if I call them on the phone, they're going, no, I don't know anything about banking. They're going to ask me some question. I, I'll go, I don't know. I'm just an accountant. So we turned the TV on and we're watching Channel 5 News. Dick Norris is there. And, he, and all of a sudden he comes out and he says, here's the institutions that are closed. He has these five or seven institutions that are closed on this side of the chalkboard. And then he has the institutions that are the good institutions, and we're on the ones that are staying open. We're looking for our name. We go, there it is. Okay. It's called Home Credit Financial back then. And so we turn it off, and we go, what does that mean? And they go, well, we're open. But guess what? We have no lines of credit. No one would lend to us. We have a total of $20,000 in cash. That's it. $20,000 in cash. So when you've seen the story, It's a Wonderful Life, and you see Jimmy Stewart, and he's sitting there, and they have a run on it, that's me. I'm Jimmy Stewart. Mm -hmm. So what happens is to, we all get there, and we say, okay, we've got to get to work early. 
we could have a run on the bank. And if we have a run on the bank, we're done. We only have $20,000. That's it. We only have $20,000. First Security Bank is not in a situation that they'll give us any money. We can't borrow. No one will lend to us. I mean, because, you know, we don't have FDIC insurance. Once we get FDIC insurance, everything changes. But right now we got $20,000. And we got people that have deposits with us. See, we have been taking deposits because the, the industrial banks were able to take deposits because the fund that they had was a guarantee fund. It was not an insured fund. So we had, we had a, a million and a half dollars, maybe a couple of million dollars in deposits. If those people came in, there's no way we could have funded it. So we get there early, we're waiting for the phones to ring, and a few, phone, a few calls call up, and they ask about the other institutions that are closing, and we go, oh, we're sorry about that. You should have the money with us. Thanks for calling. Talk to you. Call us in a few months. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Don't talk too long. And uh, so there we are, nerve wrack, try to get it. So now we apply for a bond, and no one will talk to us. I mean, we can't get an insurance company to even talk to us because they go, what's your assets? And I go, $3 million. They go, how much capital do you have? And I go, 200000 <laughs> And they're going, uh, uh, call us in a few years. <laughs> you know? So we finally get an individual on our board, and he says, I can get you insurance through Lloyd's of London. And uh, we go, well, how much is it going to cost? And they go, it's going to cost $25,000. And I go, I'm, we can't pay that. I said, we're only making $1,200 a month. That's our total income. After we pay everything, we're making $1,200. If we buy the thing for $25,000, we'll have a loss this year. So the board basically met and said, we don't care. They, I said, I'm opposed to it. And the board, everybody on the board said, no, we're getting, you have to go and get it. Which was hard for me because I didn't want to do it. So I make a call to Lloyd's of London. And they say, you have to send us $5,000 non-refundable. You have to wire it. Well, we didn't have any way of wiring, so I have to go down to Dennis and have him wire out my $5,000. And we wire it out. Very next day, I get a call from another company. And they said, hey, we've got, we're going on the limb for you guys. We're going to give you a bond. And I said, how much is it? And he goes, it's $3,600. And I go, a month? <laughs> and he goes, no, a year. And I go, bind it. So then I call up and I, I call up the guy that I wired the money to and I said, I need my money back. And he goes, it's non-refundable. And I go, okay, let me tell you my story, what I've gone through. So I tell him the story and he comes back. He goes, you know, that's a great story. I'll give you four of the $5,000 back. And I said, okay, it's a deal. So he gave me the $4,000 back. Right after that, we ended up getting FDIC insurance. It, it was in October. In December of 1986, there was a, the other thrift that had been approved by FDIC, did not have insurance yet. It needed a part of their was to get the bond, and they needed capital infusement. They needed $2 million. It was a bigger institution. It was $36 million. For me, I looked at that and I thought, boy, that's a real bank, not like me. I'm $3 million. That's 36. That's, you know, I, if I could just be 36 million, that'd be wonderful. And uh, what happened is Elaine Weiss w had a hearing bef bef and mentioned that the bank needed to have a capital infusement and that the deposits were not insured. The very next day, there was a run on that bank, just like in the 20s. And, and there was a run, and the line went out, and, the, and Foothill, it was Foothill Thrift and Loan, and it was up in Foothill Village on 13th South and, uh, what is that, High, um, Foothill Boulevard. And uh, there was a run. And the bank became insolvent, and the state of Utah closed the bank down, and Zions ended up acquiring that branch. And that company had, it, it was profitable. It was making money. It was profitable. It had capital. But because of the run that was generated, the bank went insolvent and was, and was seized. So you can, you can be in business and you can do everything right and still fail. And there's a lot of people that succeed, you know, that you look at and go, hey, what is, what's all that about? Um, Maybe if there's any questions. Oh, I'm sorry, I've rambled on. Any questions? <laughs> you know, 
I, I, I can tell you what my weakness is, uh, you know. Um, let's see, when do we stop, Dennis? 10-2. Ten 10-2, ten okay. So, um, go ahead. I just wanted to ask, what would you do different if you would go back in time, like considering... I'd probably exercise more. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, that's, that's a tough question, you know. I mean, there are, there are a lot of mistakes that we've made along the way. Um, I've started businesses and closed businesses. Uh, we had an insurance company that we, we uh, uh, started and uh, it didn't work out and uh, so we closed it. Um, I, think, I think what ends up happening is can you learn from your mistakes? I don't know whether I would do anything different. I mean obviously I'd like to uh, do some things not go through what I, we went through a very difficult time with FDIC uh, just recently. They put our bank under a cease and desist order. My FDIC premiums went from $86,000 a year to $550,000 a year. Um, they classified loans that I don't think should have been classified. Now all of that's changed now and they're my friends again. And, uh, there's, but, but they've lost credibility for us and, and I think that's an unfortunate situation. I think they were overreactive. But, but um, I am, me and my partner, we are, we're dinosaurs because there are very few owner operators of banks today and there's fewer and fewer. That, that was not the case when we started. Um, there, there were a lot, banks were just like any other business. But I think, um, I think you have to recognize uh, um, when to pull the plug. Um, and, and that's a hard thing. When, when you're nurturing something and you're trying to get it to go and you're trying to grow it, it's very difficult to, and, and you, have to rem you have to make sure that your ego does, your ego is a great thing. I mean, it's what makes you, I mean, I, trust me, I have an ego. I, everyone who is here has a certain ego. But you have to be able to step back and say, I am not going to let that run my life. And uh, if, if things are not working out, you have to all of a sudden say, that didn't work out and we may need to regroup and try something different. Right now in the banking industry, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, John, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm just wondering, uh, now that you're over the cease and desist, uh, what is your uh, plan moving forward? I think that was... Um, okay, plan moving forward. You know, the banking industry has changed. I mean, right now, the game plan for me was that I would build the bank, I would wake up one morning, we'd be $250 million in assets, I'd have five, six branches, and I'd be in a little older than I am now. I mean, I'm 61 right now, and when I hit 62, that was kind of the game, I would sell the bank. And I'd get a multiple, and, uh, and I'd be sitting on the board, whether I'm an idiot or not, people would still have me on the board because I'd have enough money, but that game changed. And what ended up happening is the days of brick and mortar are, are costly now. So what's happening right now, we have, a, we have moved towards online banking. And we've embraced it aggressively. Um, you can be in Keokuk, Iowa, and open a CD at Home Savings Bank in your jammies. <laughs> and uh, it's, a, it's been an ex extremely exciting and wonderful thing for funding the balance sheet. And so what we're doing is we're liquidating real estate. Our, our game plan originally was that we were really a real estate investment company disguised as a bank. And all the real estate that we acquired has really been, we're liquidating the, the real estate so that we can take that money and put it into cash which will can be, be converted into loans. So, so the game plan has changed. The other thing is, is, is that with me, I mean, you know, I'm in my 60s my partner's in his 60s, we figure that we've got a 10 more years of, of running. And at the end of 10 years, then we'll evaluate where we are. And I don't see community banks being sold like they were, but, but maybe what ends up happening is it becomes through a liquidation or maybe it is a sell. But that's 10 years from now. So in 10 years, then, then, I, then we make a change. But, but I think um, moving forward, we have, we have challenges, but I guess what I'm saying is anything that you're looking for in trying to determine if you want to be an entrepreneur is to find, first of all, I think you have to love what you do. 
I mean, there's a lot of people that they go to work for someone and it's hell. I mean, they have, it's known as golden handcuffs. They're paid a lot of money, but their lives are miserable and they hate it. And, and if that's, that's the course that you choose, life isn't short enough. I mean, because it end up, ends up happening with the pressure and that you wake up one morning, and I'm not saying that you don't have pressure as an entrepreneur, but, but what happens with us is we actually, if you like what you do, you're up for the challenge of slaying the dragon. Um, I, and I think the worst thing you can do is have golden handcuffs. I think you have to have integrity. You surround yourself with good people. I don't care if my people are the smartest people, but I do care that they're honest and they're hardworking. And I, and I want to make sure that they realize that I appreciate them. I think um, um, there, there'll be many challenges facing you through your life, whether it's personal or financial. You know, a lot of people are very successful in business, but their personal lives are terrible. Um, so that's something that you have to w weigh because there's tremendous sacrifices that you have to make in regards to business. Go ahead. So as an entrepreneur building something from nothing, essentially, why would you want to sell your business? Why would you want to pass it down to future generations? I think what ends up happening is whether or not you have an, an individual in your family that may have an interest in that. Uh, the other thing is uh, the time is different. I mean, for example, to start a bank that I, the way I started it, was much easier than it is today. And the other thing is, is that may or may not happen. I mean, what ends up happening is I have, I have, a, I have control, I have a majority control of the bank, of our holding corporation, and there's other people involved. So, you know, I got 10 years to think about that. So that's a decision that I have to think about also. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, would you consider a student people which are getting their bachelor Right. This person, and I understand it should be a package of it, uh, like for real, ready for the real life. For real life. Yeah. What, what you know what I think? You, you know, you have to remember that I was an accounting major, and then I went to work for a CPA firm, and I did get uh, my uh, my license. Um, my partner wonders how I did it because he's also a CPA. He goes, "What school did you go to?" But I do think that. Um, education is extremely important. I do think that sometimes what ends up happening um, in accounting um, is you have to, what ends up happening with accounting, I think accounting is an extremely important aspect of, uh, but it's, you have to be in balance with other items, management, marketing, um, and you have to look outside of the box. Sometimes what happens in accounting, you end up uh, count, you know, you're there to, to see what has happened versus what will happen. And I have to force myself to do that. Um, I'm going to end with just one quote, and that is, you know, and that it's success cannot make you happy, but happiness can make you success. Thank you for having me. Thanks, John. Uh, Thank you. We appreciate you being here and, and uh, sharing that with us. And thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, take a look for the uh, next week's uh, speaker, and we'll see you back then.